Welcome to Crime Over Cocktails. I'm Tiffany, your host. I'm going to talk about the case of Michael Thomas Gargiulo. Everything that you'll hear on tonight's episode is from CBS News, CBS's 48 Hours Mystery, ABC7 in Chicago, and Article Bio, and Wikipedia. Michael Gargiulo was born on February 15th in 1976 in Glenview, Illinois. He was the oldest of seven siblings, the oldest boy at least, who would go on to make quite the name for himself. Trisha Passasio was 18 years old when she met Michael in August of 1993. She was a neighbor of his. She was friends with one of Michael's sisters, and he was friends with one of her brothers. Them two weren't exactly friends, but I mean, obviously, they saw a lot of each other. He had even given her a ride one time to go to her boyfriend's house. On August 14th, 1993, she was coming home from a night out with friends, and she reached her doorstep. Just as she was starting to walk into her house, Michael attacked her. It appeared that he had been hiding in bushes or somewhere, kind of like a lion in wait. He attacked her and stabbed her, and when he was done, he just left her body there. Her father found her body the next day, and she still had her key in her hand. Trisha had been stabbed at least a dozen times. Some of them were just fatal on their own. Some punctured her heart and her lungs, her abdomen her back, her arm. Her arm was so twisted that it snapped. They were able to collect DNA from her fingernails, but I mean, technology at that time was not on the up and up, so they didn't really have anything. And even when it did advance, they still couldn't really do anything because... The DNA sample that was taken from Trisha was on a single swab. They didn't know if it was from on top of her nail, in her nail. You couldn't prove it. So in 1998, Michael decided he was going to start fresh and he moved to Los Angeles. There he decided he wanted to be an actor or a model. I guess you could say he was an above average looking guy. I mean, now I know what he's capable of. So, I mean, that's just kind of creepy. But it did kind of... He came across a director, Temple Brown, who was still attending film school at USC, and he cast Michael as a boxer in one of his movies. He said it was because he could actually box. He had boxing experience, and he just thought he was perfect for the part. He also worked with Anthony DiLorenzo and Temer Leary in the 1990s. They were working as bouncers at a Hollywood nightclub called the Rainbow Bar and Grill. Michael would later move on from the nightclub and acting, and he went to work for a heating and cooling company. I know of an odd switch, but I mean, hey. Ashley Elrin was 22, living in Hollywood, and she was attending LA's Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. People described her as beautiful, fun, and spontaneous. Ashley had met the then 24-year-old guy that they knew as Mike. They were all living in a close proximity, and Chris Duran was outside fixing a flat tire. And Mike was walking down the road and actually stopped and offered to see if he needed any help. Well, at that same time, Ashley was coming out of her house. And she was renting a house somewhere on that street. The two kind of locked eyes and they talked for a little bit and they all hung out for a sec. Those two ended up exchanging phone numbers and went on their way. A friend of Ashley, Justin Peterson, said that Mike would constantly start to call the house. And he was always trying to spend time with Ashley. Not only that, but he was showing up uninvited to places that she was at. It was starting to make her very uncomfortable, and she was not interested. Especially one night, he walked into a house party, sat down, and just, like, stared at her. It was creepy as fuck. 
February 22nd, 2001, she was in her home. She was getting ready to go out on a date with Ashton Kutcher. He was taking her out to dinner in a post-Grammys party. She met Ashton in December of 2000. When Ashton showed up to pick Ashley up, there was no answer at the door. Turns out, Ashley was stabbed 47 times in her apartment before he got there. Her injuries included the neck, a severed head, deep punctures in her chest, her back, and her stomach. Some of these were up to six inches deep. Detective Tom Small said one stab wound actually penetrated the skull and took out a chunk like a puzzle piece. Her body was discovered the next morning by her roommate Jennifer lying right outside of the bathroom. You could tell she had just gotten out of the shower. Seriously, that would be my fucking luck. I have a date with like Chris Hemsworth and this fucking man comes and murders me. Michael was a person of interest in her case as well, but there was no evidence at the scene. Marina Bruno, 32 years old, she was living in El Monte, California. She had moved from El Salvador to the U.S. when she was a teenager, and it wasn't that long after that she met her husband. Well, the marriage didn't work out so well. Turned out he was abusive, so she wanted a fresh start. She was starting her life over. She was separating from her husband. And at that time, he was taking custody of their four children. They had two-year-old twins, a four-year-old, and a five-year-old. Holy fuck, that will make you drink. She also was a neighbor of Michael. She had just moved into that apartment ten days She had picked that building because you have to either have a passcode or a key just to get in the front door. She felt like she was very safe there. On December 1st, 2005, she was brutally attacked in her own bed. She was stabbed 17 times. He climbed in through her kitchen window. Her ex-husband was the one to find her body and it was just mutilated. He told the 911 dispatcher that he found her body in a pool of blood. Both of her breasts had been cut off. One of her nipples was in her mouth. Could you imagine walking in on that scene? That's some sick shit. There's still little evidence. The only thing they were able to find was a single blue cotton surgical shoe covering. And on that contained a drop of Maria's blood. It's all they had, though. And at the time, they didn't have anything to compare it to. Michelle Murphy, 26 years old, in Santa Monica, was also a neighbor of Michael. They were more kind of like diagonal, though. Like, if he was at the right angle... He could see right into her apartment if she had the blinds open. Girl, don't open those blinds. Everyone who lives in an apartment right now, I want you to go out and look out your window. Can anyone see in? And if so, keep that window locked. Keep the blinds down. April 28th, 2008, Michelle was going to bed like any other night. She went to bed at 1030 but was woken up less than an hour later to a man straddling her in her own bed, stabbing her all over her body. He got her arm, her shoulder, her chest, but Michelle was able to kick him off and onto the floor. That scared the shit out of him. He ran out of the room and ran towards the front door of her house. She immediately called her boyfriend who called 911. She got him good. She ended up injuring him, and he was bleeding. She wasn't able to identify who the attacker was, but luckily there was a blood trail going from her apartment to his apartment. So they were able to see where he went. After that DNA match, he was arrested within 24 hours. And then all the pieces started coming together. Now, they have DNA. They have blood. Are those going to match too? 
Michael was arrested by the Santa Monica Police Department on June 6, 2008. Sergeant Richard Lewis said that when he was taken into custody, Michael's response was, which agency are you? And he said he kind of was like dumbfounded because obviously that tells me you're not sure which crime you're going to get charged for. There's more than one victim. We got to look more into this guy. After they did their homework on September 4th, 2008, he's already in jail with the attempted murder of Michelle. He was also indicted on two additional charges. One for Ashley and one for Maria. On July 7th of 2011, he was indicted for the murder of Trisha. The media came up with all kinds of names for him. He was the Hollywood Ripper, the Chiller Killer, and the Killer Next Door. I think I saw somewhere else the Boy Next Door. He was being held at a Los Angeles County Jail while he was waiting for capital murder trial. A pre-trial hearing was held on June 9th, 2017. And that's when the Los Angeles Superior Court said, all right, let's schedule this for October of 2017. Well, after a bunch of delays, his trial began on May 2nd of 2019. Prosecutor Dan Aikman said that Michael targeted women who lived near him and waited for the perfect opportunity to attack them right in or near their homes, and that these were totally planned killings. This whole time, Michael thinks that he's not guilty. I'm innocent. Defense tried to say that what they had was circumstantial. There was no hard evidence. Nobody knew what was going on. Now 37-year-old Michelle took the stand. Per CVS, it says, I woke up with someone on top of me, stabbing my arm. I could tell it was a knife. I thought it was serrated. I grabbed at the knife with both hands. I wrapped my hands around the blade. I was trying to hold the knife and get some leverage to stop him from stabbing me. I was still being stabbed. I was just trying to wiggle around to keep from getting hit. She could recall that she was screaming and she was repeatedly asking him, why are you doing this? Why are you stabbing me? But he never answered. She said at some point during the assault, she kicked him to the floor. He ran out of the room toward the front door of the home. According to Newsweek, also, she followed him into the living room. And then before Michael actually left her apartment, He told her, I'm sorry. What the fuck? (laughs) In May of 2019, Ashton Kutcher testified. He told them that they had plans to go to dinner, but he was running late and he kept pushing back his arrival time. That the last time he had spoke with Ashley was 824 that evening and that she had just gotten out of the shower. He didn't arrive to her front door until 1045. He said he was confused because the lights were on, but nobody was answering. He knocked on the door. He knocked again and again. And at this point, he just figured that she was pissed off and she left for the night. He took too long. She didn't want to wait. He did state, though, as he was leaving, he peeked through her window and saw what looked like a stain on the floor. He thought that he saw some wine because he went to a house party not that long before. And it was kind of like a college party. So he didn't really think much about it. She got pissed off. Maybe she threw her wine glass and she took off. The next day when he found out what actually happened, he went to detectives because he was freaked out. His fingerprints were on the door. And that stain would later be Ashley's blood. It wasn't wine. I didn't know this until I read one of CBS's articles that the jurors were actually taking outside of the courtroom so they could see how close he actually lived to these people. Well, the ones that are in the area, obviously. August 15th, 2019, he was convicted on all counts. The penalty phase of his California trial started on October 7th of 2019. 
he was facing either death or life sentence without parole. Now, this is sad. One of his sons, who was 16 at the time, took the stand and told the jurors, like, I don't see a sociopath. I don't see a murderer. All I see is my father. That's tough. That's tough. Look how many people he took away. He has tried to say that there's culpability that would raise reasonable doubt. There could have been other people responsible for this. They wanted the jury to show mercy and urge them to consider testimony about Michael's upbringing, including a forensic psychologist account of childhood abuse by family members. It's believed that he was sexually abused as a child, even by his own father. Ashley's father spoke and said, no, this took two decades to get to sentencing. A man who killed for the thrill of it. Michelle also spoke to the judge and told them that, you know, this has been an exhausting journey, not to mention the long lasting effects. She still fears spending the night alone. I'm sure she's scared of the dark. Things like this don't just go away. They linger. After several hours of deliberation on October 18th, 2019, the jury gave Michael death. Problem is, he's not going to be executed. Governor Gavin Newsom declared a freeze on executions in 2019. On July 16th, 2021, Michael was sentenced to death and is now expected to be extradited to Illinois for Trisha's case. If extradited and convicted in Illinois, he will face a sentence there of 25 years to life. Forensic psychologist Chris Mahandi told 48 Hours that for serial killers like Michael, stalking isn't enough. At some point, they have to take it to the next step. They have to actually kill in order to get the same degree stimulation. He did not touch any of these girls in a sexual way. It was all about the power. It was all about the strength. It was about the fear. Say it before, say it again. People who have been abused become abusers because that's how they take their strength back. They put fear onto others and they enjoy that because they know exactly what that's like. And that's power. How many people have to die before there's answers? Tell me what you think about this case. Things like this happen more than you think. Gotta stay vigil. Know your surroundings. Make sure to head over to crimeovercocktails.com. Lots of good resources for you there where you can also listen to episodes. Check it, Check out the page. Like always, you guys, thank you so much for listening. And we'll talk crime another time. Bye.